Thank you so much for being here with us today, Mr. Aaron A. Train Smith. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you because I think you've had a really fascinating story. And let's start at the beginning here. Okay. You've said that your mom was also musically inclined. Uh, what is your favorite musical memory of you when you were a child? Oh, when I was a child, um, I would always have to go with my mom to choir rehearsal on Tuesday nights. And I had to go to all of her performances. And I think the, 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 the thing I remember the most is when they, used, when they did uh, Handel's Messiah every Easter. That, that was really cool. And then after, after some time, they would join with other churches around Durham, North Carolina, and perform uh, the Messiah. And, you know, over time, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's great memory. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. That didn't take you long at all to have that one pop in. <laughs> no. <laughs> Pretty dominant one then. Uh, did your mom play instruments or sing, or what was her specialty? She just sang. She was a soprano in the choir. She started singing in the senior choir at St. Joseph's AME Church when she was 17. And I think she stopped when she was like 84, 85. Very nice. So I'm going to go in forward a little bit to preteen and teenage Aaron. Uh, you played drums in the school band. So my question if you could give advice to teenage Aaron Smith, what advice would you give him now? Teenage Aaron Smith, I would tell him to pay more attention to uh, what, he sh what they're trying to teach him in school. You know, just focus a little bit more <laughs> on, on, on things other than, other than music, because music, music was kind of easy. I just fit into that and it was never a struggle whereas uh, sometimes others curricular was a struggle sometimes I barely got through so I'd, I'd go back and tell myself to um, you know figure it out study harder study longer um, also I'd tell the musical me to get a teacher Wow. As soon as possible. Still thinking kind of young life of Aaron. For our students, for a lot of students, it's sometimes difficult to take a chance when you're a teenager or early 20s and you've got these difficult decisions and you can take a chance on something. So I know that at the age of 20, you auditioned and then played drums on the recording of Papa Was a Rolling Stone with patients. Now, that has to take nerve to be able to audition in my mind. So how did you get the guts to do that, to say, yep, I'm going to do it? Well, actually, it happened kind of in a different kind of way. I was, um, I was playing with this Motown artist uh, by the name of Chuck Jackson. And uh, we were touring, mostly... Um, like doing what they call the Chitlin Circuit down south and some, some northern gigs along the eastern seaboard. But we would always go to Detroit and play the 20 grand um, showroom. And um, it's a great showroom. A lot of Motown artists recorded live albums there. And I was playing with Chuck there and Mr. Norman Whitfield, who was... Temptations producer came to the show and after the show uh, he came up introduced himself you know and asked me where I was from and you know just you know general questions and he said well what are you doing tomorrow and I said um, nothing I have to be back here tomorrow at eight o'clock to play and that's about it so he said he, he, he wanted to know where I was staying, and I was staying right there at the 20 Grand because they have a, a, Motown, a motel as well. And he picked me up that morning, took me to Hitsville, 
and we recorded um, a song called Smiling Faces. It was a big hit by this group called The Undisputed Truth. Um, but the Temptations version wasn't that successful. It was on one of their albums, and I mean, it was, it was okay, but he gave it to another group, and that group recorded it, and be, it became a hit. So after that, that was kind of like my audition. And um, so after that, he came to the show the next night, and he said, well, you know, this is what I want you to do. I, if you want to, I want you to move to Detroit, and um, I have work for you. I, wanna, I want you to uh, play in this band, which was the Undisputed Truths band. And uh, we'll do sessions and s stuff like that. I said, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. And uh, this was like in October of 70. In January of 71, I got drafted. And um, I went into the Army for a month and two and a half weeks, and I got out on a medical discharge. But, you know, back then there was no cell phone or anything, no way to contact people unless you knew their home telephone number or their work telephone number. So there was, I didn't know any of that from Norman, and he had my home telephone number but it was home with my mom, and my mom worked during the day. So he would be calling the house to find out where I was so that he could book my ticket and, and get me to Detroit. And he never got an answer. She was always at work, no answering machines, anything like that. So after I got out of the Army, I came home. I got my gig back with Chuck Jackson. And about two months after that, we were back in Detroit. And Norman came to the show again. And he was like, where have you been? <laughs> I've been calling you. <laughs> so I, I told him the whole story. I, you know, I've been drafted. I've gone through basic training and stuff like that. So he said, well, the, I still want you to come up here and uh, be with the Undisputed Truth. By this time, the Undisputed Truth's version of uh, Smiling Faces was a big hit on the radio. And um, so I moved to Detroit in October. And once I got here, there, uh, I started doing sessions, recording, you know, the Temptations uh, sessions and the Undisputed Truth sessions. And one of those sessions happened to be a Papa, Ro Papa was a Rolling Stone session. Wow. Did you ever meet Barry Gordy? I saw Barry once. I went downtown. The, the business office was downtown on Grand, was it Grand Boulevard, yes. And um, I strolled through the building occasionally. And, and one day I remember passing by his office and he was at his desk. And um, I said, hello. And he said, hello, young man. And I just kept walking. And I was pretty nervous. <laughs> I understand. It's very gordy, absolutely. So uh, with Papa, he reached number one the Billboard charts. Yeah. He won, two, he won two Grammys. And I know you also achieved success with just many other recordings what is something about the recording process that would surprise people? Uh, how tedious it is. It's very oh. tedious. Um, and and the, the nerves, you know, because it's more, more pressure in a recording studio than it is on a live stage because everything is mic'd. You know, your every little thing is picked up, every little mistake, and 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 if you're on the clock, you know, it's like if you're on the clock for a session, and technically a session is like three hours, so you have to like really have it together, your nerves, your ability confidence and all that sort of stuff to go into the studio and record and record with other people who are feeling the same pressure and have to be prepared in the same way 
and you get this piece of music that's brand new and uh, you have to interpret it and interpret it in a way that the artists, you know, you have to get into the writer's head and the producer's head to, to, to wow. put on tape what they envision their song to be. And um, that's the challenge, but that's also the beauty of it because you're creating something brand new and it's going to be around forever. Um, are, can you, are you a music reader or do you mainly, is it by ear where you can pick up on something? I can read charts. I can read drum charts. Yes. I had a friend of mine, Mike Hicks in Nashville and, and I remember him telling me that he, he plays keys and he said, it, it's all ear. You can just hear it. Music has a, a distinctive form, you know, popular music. Uh, they have a system here in, in Nashville called the Numbers System, uh, where they write out uh, numbers um, that relate to certain chords and, and a chord progression, like one, four, five, one, um, stuff like that. And most musicians here in Nashville know the number system and you'd be surprised that a, a lot of them can't read music if you wrote out the notes and stuff you know that they wow. couldn't do it you know but the number system they're very familiar with that's fascinating so you also worked with the legendary ray charles and with which also means that enough people like your work and respected you and there's a little word of mouth about Aaron A. Train Smith, you got to get this guy. So, how would you say work ethic has opened up avenues for you in your career? Work ethic has prepared me for prepared me for the unknown. You know, um, practice above what I usually am going to be called on to do. One reason for that, and the main reason for that, is because I. I still love the practice. <laughs> I, still, I still love the challenge of not being able to do something today and being able to do it maybe four months from now. I think if you have a work ethic, I think there's something, some outside forces, you know, that <laughs> they kind of take you in a direction, you know. If you focus your energies and your intent on something, I, I think you eventually are led down a, a certain trail. You know what I mean? Yeah. It might sound a little mystical or something, but um, that's where you're going to be. Have you ever gotten burnt out from drumming? Or because it is your job, but it's also your passion. Mm -hmm. um, not burnt out per se, but um, I have taken breaks from practicing only because um, sometimes if you take a, like if you've been practicing on this really hard thing and your muscles and, and your body are getting accustomed to doing this thing, you're demanding of it and you just get to a, a point to where, okay, I, I think I have, I think I have it. I understand it now, but I really, it's not a real p a part of me, something that I just do naturally. I still have to think about it. So I, I have found that when you get to a point like that, you back away from it. You know, maybe for a couple of days, maybe for a week or so, do something else. And then you come back to it and you're, you'll find that you're, something has happened there, you know, in your muscle response, in your muscle memory, because drumming is a has a lot to do with muscle memory and um, how your hands and fingers act and your all your limbs work together. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, you take a break and you come back and it's like you're refreshed. Everything is refreshed and, and uh, you, you, you move on from there. Question just popped in my head. I, I've taught thousands of students and... Um, the percussionists in the band were usually the kids in class who liked to beat on the desk with their pencils. Was that you? Uh, yes. My mom said when I, was a, when I was small, I used to sit at her, 
on the floor at her feet while she was doing dishes and beat on the pots and pans. And that's a very common story with a lot of drummers. You know, they used to beat on the pots and pans and the parents went, oh, maybe he's a drummer. Maybe she's a drummer, you know. And um, so it never went that far until uh, we had um, band in public school, but it didn't start until the sixth grade. So uh, when my mom is singing in the choir, and the choir director is the band director for the elementary school. So, you know, she tells me this, she told me this story. She, she asked me if I wanted to be in the band because it was brand new, you know, sixth grade now I can be in the band. And I said, yeah, so what, what do you want to do? I want to play drums. Um, so she talked to the choir director and Advi you know, he told her what to get me, you know, uh, get this uh, Baldwin band builder for drums and two B drumsticks and told me to, you know, told my mom that when we, when we signed up for sixth grade to include band on my schedule. So I get in the band and we're, we practice in the cafeteria and there, nobody has a drum. Um, we when, whenever it was time for the drummers to play, which was only on Fridays, <laughs> we'd have to play on the uh, cafeteria table. And uh, so um, Monday through Thursday, all the drummers are standing up like this, holding their sticks, listening, listening to all the other beginning musicians like on clarinet and trumpet squawk and squeal and, <laughs> and, and so Friday it's like our day you know yes. <laughs> but when I first when we first started you know we had all these drummers you know it's like everybody wanted to play drums but because you never got to play or anything you know it kind of fizzled out so by the end of the year, I think out of maybe 15 guys who wanted to be drummers, there were maybe five left, you know. Wow. <laughs> and you were one of them. I was That's one right. of them. <laughs> That's I, great. I, I didn't quit. I didn't know I could quit. <laughs> I didn't know you could quit. <laughs> That's I'm glad, great. I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. Well, with uh, touring then, I know you've done a lot of touring. Mm -hmm. Toured with many different musical artists what is your oddest touring memory that you have the oddest touring memory memory i have is <laughs> i and you know i was just thinking about this the other day um when i first went on the road with my mom's blessings <laughs> i i went on the road with chuck jackson and we had a station wagon, and we pulled a U-Haul on the back. Um, I had just gotten my driver's license, and I really didn't, I hadn't been on the freeway a lot, you know? But uh, when, I, when I got in the van, because I was the youngster in the van, they had me drive at night. It's like, it like the rookie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn how to drive on the freeway. And I remember one night, one of the guys was sitting up front with me, and he noticed that every time I came to a curve, I would slow down, you know, depress the brake. And he was going, uh, uh, Smith, Smith, you don't have to do that every time you come to the curve. The, the highways are designed that if you were going in the speed limit, you could just keep going that speed and, and it's going to work out. It's going to be okay. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I learned how to drive on the freeway. The other weird experience was with Chuck Jackson. Um, it was like my first gig with Chuck Jackson. And we played down in Florida. Uh, and I had never been to Florida before, and it was beautiful. The weather was beautiful. And so we finished the gig. I think we were there for a weekend, 
and we're waiting to get paid. And we were waiting, and we were waiting that day, because we we're, we're, we're going to get paid and then go to the next gig. And so when we don't, you know, we get tired of waiting, and we leave the hotel to go get breakfast. And we come back, and all of our hotel rooms have been locked. You know, they used to put this thing in the keyhole so that your key wouldn't work. You know, and it was because <laughs> Chuck hadn't paid the hotel oh, bill. No. <laughs> so, and so we we're sitting there, and, and thank God it's a beautiful day. And so we go out and sit by the pool, and our band director, we un unhitch the U-Haul trailer, and he gets into the station wagon, and he drives around the city in Florida, calling, you know, he calls people, you know, asking them, have they seen Chuck, calls the club owner and stuff. And so he finally finds him, gets back to the hotel, and it's like 2.30, 3 in the afternoon, you know. And that's all we've been doing, all just sitting <laughs> by the pool, waiting for him to get back, because we can't get in a room to get our clothing and whatever else we had in there. So, yeah. Wow. That's, that's a trip. Absolutely. <laughs> So you've been in the music business for almost 50 years. Yeah. Uh, from The Temptations to Ray Charles to Michael W. Smith to Kevin Max. What has stayed the same about the music business and what, what has changed the most? Well, with, with COVID-19, what has changed the most is there's no place to play anymore. Um, uh, the recording situation is different. Everybody has their own studios now. And uh, yeah. you record dis dis distance recording. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we have technology to, to do it. Um, and uh, what has remained the same, I think what has remained the same is the uncertainty of it, you know. Um, you know, a lot of people, well, you know, when, when Pro Tools, which is a recording program, Interface, uh, came in, became really popular, um, then people started recording from home, uh, which meant a lot of studios started to close because nobody was recording anymore from studios. You didn't have the big budgets anymore to record. Uh, that changed, too. Record companies changed their, their tune. Uh, record companies started buying other record companies. And so you had, like, one conglomerate that now owned all this, all this material. Um, and so gradually... In order to like really make a living as a musician, you had to get a really good road gig, you know, with a, a artist. And here in Nashville, you know, it's like mostly with a you had to get with a good country artist, um, a group, and tour. And that's what you do, you tour. Um, and because the studio thing was diminishing. A lot of the A players in the studio would get the better live gigs, you know, because they had to survive too, you know, so they started going on the road. There used to be a time when studio musicians would not go on the road, would not take a tour because the producers would stop calling you. So they strategized that if I want to be a recording musician, I need to stay home. But that's not the case anymore. So that has changed. That whole, the way things work has changed. The way people buy music, Spotify, um, all those outlets. Um, and another thing has changed is um, the, the amount of royalty that a musician or a, a writer gets for their, for their product has changed. Absolutely. Do you, um, I know you, like you said, people are recording um, away from each other now, distance recording. Mm -hmm. 
still like to get into a studio with musicians or record or are you now, is it almost better or more comfortable when everyone's recording a part and then someone can piece it all together? Well, it's very comfortable recording a part because there's nobody staring at you, you know, it's oh. right. That's no pressure, you know. <laughs> so you know they 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 send you a tune via email. You load it into your interface, um, and uh, you sit there and listen to it over and over, and you figure out what you're gonna do, and you you play it, and you play it. You you can probably play it. Well, you can play it as many times as you as you want, and uh, you send all those performances back. And and um, whoever you're working for will critique them and maybe ask for a redo, maybe not. Maybe you've sent them enough that they can take stuff from each one of those performances you've sent and put to put one really good performance together. But um, the last time I was in the studio with a bunch of people was last year, and. They were all really good friends of mine from way back. Um, mm -hmm. And Charlie Peacock was producing. Mm -hmm. and it was his tunes. And um, it was fun. I, it, was, it was fun because I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't walk into the studio and, and meet a bunch of people that I'd never met before, you know, um, uh, and have to get to know them. And and get to know the music and record the music all in the same three hours, you know. Uh, so it was fun, and we hung out. We had dinner together the night before. Talked about old times. Made that studio the next morning, and you know we did about. I think we did like six songs that day. Well, you know, and speaking of all the people that you've made friendships throughout the years kind of segues when I had another thought was music can also be about making connections with people throughout the years. So how have making connections played a big part in your career? Hmm. Well, just yesterday I did a, a, a recorded uh, for on a piece for a film that's coming out next year. And I got that call because a friend recommended me. Yeah, the producer called him, asked him for a, a, a drummer, you know, a drummer, told him, described the song and what he wanted, and he said, call Aaron. And he called me, and uh, yeah, I, did, I went out, did session yesterday, and it's on the... Um, it's on a film called Death in Texas. It's going to be out next year. Nice. So it really is. A, I mean, I think it's important for students to know, too, as they get older and they get out. It is about those connections. Then things. Yeah, yeah. definitely. My daughter, my oldest daughter, uh, works in television out in L.A. And uh, she went to uh, USC, University of Southern Cal, and studied film and television there. And... The year she graduated, 2004, was the, the year that reality TV was starting oh. at, at uh, VH1, MTV, um, and MTV. They all had reality TV programs. And so she would go out and volunteer uh, to uh, be a scrub, you know? <laughs> And she met all these. <clears throat> she met all these other people who were fresh out of school, and some who were, you know, already in the industry. And um, she worked hard. She learned, and uh, man, for for years, even now, that's how she, she gets most of her work. Is people that have worked with her will call her and call whoever they're working with and put the two together, you know, and uh, yeah, she's moved up, she's moved up the chain now. She's a um, script producer. Wow. Yeah, so yeah. networking, networking is very important. Oh, it is. I mean, it's, you know, honestly, that's one of the reasons I thought of you today because I've followed 
Kevin Max's music for years and I've seen him in concert several times. And then I was always impressed by your playing. And, uh, and I, I just thought they, someone told me once the answer is always no, unless you ask. So I thought I'd ask and, you know, connections, you never know. Right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Now you have a pair of drumsticks that have been displayed at the rock and roll hall of fame next to one of your drumming idols, Ringo Starr. Um, at what point did you decide that I've made it or do you, maybe you don't ever feel like that or and you're always hungry for what's next or yeah. Which, which way would that be? I haven't felt that yet. Huh. <laughs> That's not a day when I ever felt that or feel that. Yeah. What would a solo Aaron A. Train Smith album sound like? It's a good question. It'd be all over the place, you know? <laughs> um, it would be hard to tie it down to any one particular style of music. You know, yeah, you have some fusion, some jazz, some pop. Um, yeah, blues. It, it would have to because if... if to be true to to myself, if I'm going to do my record, it's got to have, uh, it's got to reflect my experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I've thought about, I know just recently was the anniversary um, of the death of Rich Mullins, who I know you worked with. Do you, what is a memory you have of him? Well, we had a, uh, you know, Rich had a Jeep. Unfortunately, that's, he, he, he died in that Jeep. But uh, he would, uh, when, when I first started working with him, we never had like a tour bus. We had all these very eclectic personalities in the band. And so everybody wanted to have, we had four vehicles on the road going to the same place. And once we went to Wichita, we played this concert in Wichita. And the next day we were supposed to be at this high school that was out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was just like, this high school had nothing around it but like flatlands. And, uh, Side flat Kansas, and we had to leave at five o'clock in the morning to get there because it was, we had to leave from Wichita at five to get there in time to set up play the concert because it was an afternoon concert it started at one o'clock for some reason. So Rich asked me if I wanted to ride with him. Sure, I'll ride with you, and. Uh, but what we did is like we stayed up talking. Everybody in the, on, on, that was on the tour went out that night and sat by the pool and we started talking and laughing and joking and pretty soon it's like three in the morning, you know? And we gotta leave at five. And so <laughs> we get up and I get in the, in the uh, Jeep with Rich and it's all two lane roads, you know? And coming towards us is nothing but 18 wheelers on this two lane, this two lane road. And, and Rich's uh, Jeep has a canopy top. And it's just like making all this noise from the wind from the, from the trucks. Like, just slapping back and forth, you know. And, and Rich, he's got the, he had this way of driving that you couldn't tell whether he was awake or not. <laughs> because you couldn't see, you couldn't see his face, and I swore sometimes, you know, that you know I saw his eyes closed, but I, I was so like nervous and so afraid that I stayed awake for the whole drive. Oh my god! I was exhausted because it took us like five hours to get there or something, and I was just like totally because I was determined I was not going to sleep. Because I thought if I did, 
<laughs> that would be it. Uh, uh, I'm going to stay awake and make sure this guy stays on the road. And when I see the slightest little slur swerve, I'm going to grab the steering wheel. <laughs> that, uh, that's my Rich Mullins memory that, that uh, sticks out. I'll, I'll never forget that one. I love that. That's perfect. The last question is kind of a rapid fire lightning round. I just have a couple of ended on a, on a high note. There we go. That's right. So kind of a word, uh, it's word association. Um, start with this one. Drummer injuries. I always thought you had to hurt for all the arthritis. years you've been. Arthritis. <laughs> is it your back? Is that what it is? It could be. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Big hands. Fingers. Oh. Yeah. I wonder. When you think of music you listened to in high school, what do you think of? James Brown. Oh. Nice. Is there any certain record that you liked? Uh, I liked all of James Brown's records. Nice. I saw him in concert in 1968. And that kind of blew my mind. Wow. Uh, when you think of movies in high school, what do you think of? Lawrence of Arabia. Nice. That's classic. Favorite car? I, I, I do know you have a new car, I believe. No, I don't. Oh. My, favorite, <laughs> my favorite car is a Corvette Grand Sport. Oh, nice. <laughs> my, my daughter, my birthday was September 3rd. And for a birthday present, my daughter and, and my son-in-law rented me a 2019 Grand Sport Corvette for two days, unlimited mileage. Oh, so it's not yours, but you got to, yes. <laughs> and we stayed in that car for a very long time. For those I would hope so. <laughs> we only came home to go to sleep. And then we woke up the next morning, jumped right back in the car and was... Oh, yes. All day driving, you know. What do you know for sure? That God exists. And as uh, President Bartlett from the West Wing would always ask, what's next? I don't know. You know, I never know what's next. Um, you know? After we finish talking, I'm going to go outside and unpack my truck and bring my drums back inside. And I have a student at 4 o'clock. That's, that's it. You're always busy. You've always got something going on, huh? Sometimes. Sometimes. What would it take for you to hang out those, those drumsticks? I mean, that's your life, right? What would it take? <clears throat> um, I don't know. But it's possible. It, it could come a day when I go, oh, okay, that's enough. You know, uh, whatever life I have left, maybe I can find something else to do. You know, just spend more time with other interests. Well, your, your playing brings joy to the world. Just know that. So, Thank you. I appreciate that. Those are, that's our interview for today. And uh, these have been great answers. Mr. Oh, A-Train. Where did that nickname come from? Well, I played in a band called the 77s. Yes. And we did a live album. Um, it's called 88. And there was a part in a particular song where I have a drum solo. And the lead vocalist, Michael Rowe, was introducing the, the solo. And he said, and here he is on percussion. Hey, Mr. A Train. <laughs> you know, it just kind of stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to put a shout out. Students, if you haven't heard the 77s, look up the song. Ba 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 ba, and that's just that's some great drums on that one. And I'll let you know, Aaron, that 
the teacher that's in the room with me just now, when you said you play on the 77s in the back, he got excited and said, yes. So <laughs> you've got a fan back here. <laughs> cool. That's great. Well, thank you for your time today. This has been incredible and uh, just a dream of mine. And thank you for the positive things that you've done for the world. Thank you for doing this for the students at Blackburn High School. And uh, I appreciate it. And thank you, Brian. Have a good one. Thank you.